Baltic Sea region, the space shared. We aim to have a look closer to the Baltic Sea region defining Baltic space by means of geopolitics and economy, physical infrastructure, spatial complexities. I invite you to think what is the shared space we stay and use to move. First of the four speakers in this session to open the floor is Irene Stracuzzi. Irene is an Italian graphic designer and researcher based in Netherlands, specializing in the fields of printed matter, visual identity and information design. She works on commissioned and self-initiated projects for the cultural sector. Her research practice focuses on cartography, geopolitics and science, involving design as a critical tool to analyze urgent issues. Through the discipline of information design, her projects aim at making complex information understandable and contributing to the building of critical knowledge through aesthetic means. Her work has been exhibited widely. Since 2018, she is a thesis tutor in the Information Design Master's Department at Design Academy Eindhoven. So let's hear Irene's keynote titled The Legal Status of ICE. Please, Irene, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back from lunch. Uh, apologize in advance for my awkwardness because this is not a really comfortable setup for me. Uh, as Dina already introduced me, I'm a, a graphic designer and researcher. Um, I work both on uh, printed matter, I uh, design books uh, on commissions, and it's really slow, okay. Uh, or uh, visual identities for exhibitions. And and I also work on research projects that are more uh, self-initiated. And I use the discipline of information design to talk about uh, cartographic and geopolitical issues. And I was invited today to talk about uh, this project, uh, which is called the Legal Status of ICE, and um, it's an installation that I designed two years ago uh, that deals with the changing, uh, the shifting geopolitical scenario in the Arctic Ocean. And as you may be aware of, uh, because of climate change, global warming, the polar ice cap is melting very fast. Um, but in a sort of paradox, this has become a really interesting situation for the countries bordering the Arctic Ocean because this means access to precious oil and gas resources and uh, the control of uh, shipping routes. Um, so I want to go a little bit... Uh, I want to show you the research behind this project and how I came to the Arctic Ocean situation. Uh, because for me, the research started with a question on uh, the nature of borders and why borders, why are borders interesting from a design perspective is that borders are designed. Um, especially if we look at uh, geopolitical issues such as the uh, Israeli-Palestine conflict, it is impossible to understand this conflict without looking uh, at drawn borders and at cartography. But on the other hand, not all borders are con currently mapped uh, through cartography and uh, our tools. So if we look at embassies and consulates or buffer zones between countries, uh, but also recent events of uh, land reclamation in the South China Sea, for example, we can see that these are all part of national borders, but they're not really present on maps. Uh, so the question that started uh, my research was actually why are borders visualized as linear one-dimensional lines when in fact they are not, uh, they don't exist as, as such. And even if we uh, look at the so-called natural borders, for example, uh, there's nothing linear or one-dimensional uh, about them. So uh, this is an example of a border between the Netherlands and Belgium. And this border uh, was running following the river mass, uh, but the river changed its course through the years, and this created sort of a really weird, ang oh. 
sorry, <laughs> really weird enclaves uh, between these two countries that we were used to uh, uh, drug traffickers to exchange drugs. Uh, so recently, this border was redrawn uh, using the um, by following the new course of the river. Uh, but also, if we look at antiquity. Um, Sorry, I need to get used to this. Uh, if we look at antiquities, for example, the Roman limes or the Great Wall of China, um, this, these were uh, defense lines that even though look linear, they were not understood as such because, uh, in fact, they were, uh, they were often discontinued, uh, allowing for uh, these borders to be porous, and they were not understood as uh, places that would mark the sovereignty of the state. And uh, also skipping a few centuries, looking at um, Rom a, a medieval copy of a Roman map, um, we can see kind of the same thinking. So this map is actually uh, several meters long. It represents Europe uh, in a really strange projection by following its main rivers from, the, from Great Britain to the um, Mediterranean Sea. And you can understand from this map that the users um, were not interested in seeing the divisions of land, but rather the connections uh, between the different settlements. And to get to the first border on a map, we need to skip a few centuries. Uh, in 1529, when a dispute was on between the Portuguese and the Castilian crown uh, for the ownership of the so-called Spice Islands in modern-day Indonesia, uh, and since there were not so many uh, accurate geographical information at the time, uh, the only way for them to divide the, their spheres of influence was to draw a line in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean from the Arctic to the Antarctic, and then decide on who would get the right part of the map or the left part of the map. And this besides uh, showing the first real hubristic and imperialistic attempt by European powers to conquer lands that they had even not visited. Uh, it also represents the great power that maps and cartography was, was starting to have uh, in the 16th century. Uh, and nowadays, maps are perceived as documents that can uh, end disputes between countries. And uh, uh, skipping a few centuries again, uh, in Paris in 1744, uh, a huge line was drawn on the ground and then reproduced on a map. Uh, and this was not a border in itself, but it was uh, something actually called the Paris Meridian. So uh, they were trying to get acquire precise measurements of the land by reproducing lines on a map. Um, and this really made evident how this um, Cartesian thinking of space, that it was possible to turn the Earth into a copy of its own copy. And now, uh, with the emergence of nation states um, in, in uh, conjunction with this, uh, this territorial sovereignty concept has become so powerful that it's now even difficult to imagine uh, other spatial systems of political organization. So nowadays, borders are so much embedded in the way we understand countries that we cannot think of an alternative to this. Uh, so for me, uh, the same kind of reasoning has been applied uh, currently in the Arctic Ocean, uh, where a dispute supposedly started in 2007 when a Russian submarine uh, dove into the bottom of the Arctic Ocean and planted a titanium flag uh, at the, in the location of the North Pole. And this really uh, started a race uh, for supremacy in the Arctic region. And this image of the flag planting has been associated um, with other images of dubious nature. And this reference, uh, this parallel was referenced directly by uh, people who were associated with the mission. Uh, but so even though images have no repercussions uh, in international law, this uh, venture really um, made evident that it was possible to suddenly claim portions of the Arctic Ocean. And for me, the fact that this dispute is based in the Arctic Ocean is not a coincidence, uh, because Ar the Arctic has also a history of being misrepresented in maps. Uh, so for example, if we look at Google Maps, which is one of the most used digital uh, geo-application, 
uh, we can see that because of the projection that it's used, uh, which is the Mercator projection, uh, the Arctic is only seen as a sort of uh, distant space that even has the wrong proportion, so it looks much bigger uh, than it is. Finally, last year, Google released a version that uh, accounts for the, the, the fact that the Earth is round, uh, but still the Mercator projection is, very, is widely used everywhere else, uh, especially in classrooms uh, or where um, global maps of the world need to be produced. But even if we look at historical maps of the Arctic with a more favorable, favorable projection, we can see that the Arctic has always been a place uh, where a lot of information was missing, uh, and then just replaced with uh, mythical tales or uh, centuries-old legends on, on the region. Um, so because of this, um, the Arctic has, is perceived as a place that's, that belongs to no one and is therefore open for conquest. So for me, um, with this research in mind, the interesting, I wanted to uh, show the dispute in a way that would highlight this cartographic and imperialistic nature. And so how to bring design and apply design in a way that would uh, question the boundaries of the state ownership in the Arctic Ocean. So the region I took into consideration is the region inside the Arctic Circle using a projection that's called the polar stereographic projection, that it's um, useful in the Arctic because uh, it does not distort the land in a considerable way. And the other reason is that uh, you can access this map uh, through 360 degrees, so there's not one single uh, point of view. And going back to the dispute, the countries that can uh, are currently claiming or can currently claim portions of the Arctic Oceans are five, uh, but this dispute is uh, uh, done in an orderly fashion because these countries uh, need to abide by the UN law of the sea. And to do that, they need to claim that the, the portion they want to claim is the natural prolongation of the land territory. Uh, so what happens in, in uh, in reality is that these uh, nations are sending out or have set out already scientific expeditions in order to collect the geological and paleogeological data needed to substantiate these claims. Uh, so what's very fascinating is that, as said by the government of Canada itself, in the Arctic, the currency of sovereignty is not uh, the use of military force, but is the possession of scientific data. So um, in order to show this, um, information connected to the dispute, but also its cartographic nature. Um, the project works on two levels. On the one hand, I realized um, I created a model of the seabed of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, so the depth of the ocean is uh, greatly exaggerated while the land is kept flat. And on the other hand, uh, there's a projection on top of this model that shows uh, that it's uh, useful in order to show change in data, but it's also metaphorical to show the way we impose our cartographic under understanding of the world onto reality. And uh, this projection starts with uh, showing uh, the decrease in sea ice, uh, starting from 1978 when Na NASA first started charting the ocean, uh, but also the different uh, claims uh, current claims, especially the areas that are uh, disputed between countries, uh, that are very interesting to me because it means that uh, different countries interpret the same geological data but to their own advantage. And other information connected to the dispute is, for example, um, the, the emergence of the shipping routes in the region that are increasing every year because of the reduction in sea ice. Uh, but also the current uh, oil and gas wells, as well as the um, location of the uh, military bases in the regions that are also increasing. Um, and also the projections uh, that show where the oil and gas fields would be, because actually uh, this whole venture is based on the assumption that there would be a lot of gas and oil in the Arctic Ocean, even though it's, it is very difficult to set out scientific expeditions there, so th then not everybody agrees on the amount of oil and gas that can be found currently in the Arctic. Um, 
So the whole story is told just by uh, juxtaposing different maps and different data sets, um, which also brings me to another uh, issue that I want to tackle briefly, uh, which is the neutrality of maps. So um, as you may be well aware of, uh, maps have uh, a neutral look. Uh, the information displayed on them um, looks objective. Uh, but with my project, I also wanted to show that uh, there is no objectivity about the way you visualize data, and especially uh, even though the project may, may look neutral in a way, uh, by choosing specific data sets, um, you can kind of direct uh, people's attentions towards specific issues. Um, so these are a few examples of the data that, that's uh, projected on the model. And I want to conclude with a quote that is very important in the way I see uh, design and information design. We get closer to the real not because we use a set of binoculars that do not distort the picture, but because we become aware that we are viewing the world through a set of distorting, distorting binoculars. Thank you. <laughs>